I kind of have, I don't know if, it, I've never actually checked it, but I kind of have this belief that my, I mean, my watch is synced with my phone, and my phone is synced with the internet, and so it must be exactly right. That's, I've never actually checked that, but that's about what I believe, certainly. Uh, so last time we finished by stating the local Langness correspondence. Uh, so, and <clears throat> I was carrying, I was kind of careful earlier on, I carried around a very general field E. Uh, there was an arbitrary field at the beginning, and then when I talked about Vey-Delin representations, I had that norm on the Vey group, and the norm was taking values in the positive rationals. Uh, and so, I think when we're doing Vey-Delin representations, E had better have characteristic zero. Uh, so E should certainly at least have characteristic zero, but then the question is, of course, as E changes, these sets change, right? Because somehow, you know, the number of variables you get to have changes. Uh, and to be quite honest, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if it's a good idea to state the local Langlands conjecture, uh, local Langlands correspondence over a general field E. So let me state it over the complexes, uh, where it's surely, uh, surely fine. Uh, for some fields, there's just some technical issue I'm worried about involving the square root of p. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to go into it now. So there's the local Langlands correspondence. Uh, and there's kind of an interesting statement. Because uh, for a start, I mean, uh, for a start, it's got this word canonical in, which I haven't really defined. Uh, because I don't quite really know how to define it. Uh, but we can inter I'll tell you one thing, we can interpret canonical, we can interpret the word uh, canonical as a, so there is a, there is a sensible way of doing this, we can interpret the word canonical as simply meaning uh, the bijection Uh, kind of satisfies satisfies a big list of nice properties. I, I, the bijection is compatible with, you know, uh, the bijection commutes with various things that you can think of. Uh, for example, here's a rather trivial example, e.g., e there's a notion of duality on both sides, right? on both sides. Uh, when you, you see, like, in representation theory, you have a representation of a group. The group's kind of acting on the left. Uh, so you could kind of take the dual of the vector space, then the group would act on the right. But then you could take inversion on the group, so the group would act on the left again. And now you've got another representation, and it's typically different. Uh, the trace of G in the new one is the trace of G inverse on the old one. So there's some duality here, and there's some duality here, and you kind of want to make sure that if, if rho gets matched up with pi, then the dual of rho gets matched up with the dual of pi. There's an example of this big list of nice properties. Uh, another one on the list is, uh, do you remember I defined f? I had a representation rho zero. I defined f of rho zero, the conductor. You can define conductors here. It's much harder. But uh, you would hope that the conductors on both sides match up. Uh, Later on, people realized that both sides had L functions. There's a complex value, you know, there's a complex L function, L of rho comma s and L of pi comma s, and those are supposed to match up as well. Uh, so an example of this, uh, there's a notion of duality on both sides. You know, there's L functions. There's L functions and epsilon factors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it actually took a while, uh, maybe sort of, here's my understanding of history. So my understanding of, uh, uh, somehow of the historical statement of the conjecture of the history. Uh, uh, for this group, these are the local, this is the local Langlands, maybe I should say, this is the local Langlands correspondence for GLN, really, right? Uh, 
So my understanding, I mean, I might be, I wouldn't, may, it, it's possible that I might be cor corrected by an expert, uh, maybe I've missed something, but my understanding of the history is that for GLN, uh, for this group GLN, the local language correspondence for GLN, uh, this list of properties kind of I increased over time. Uh, uh, for example, there's something called epsilon factors of pairs that turns out to be absolutely crucial. Given, a, given two things on this side, you can give them row one and row two, you can define epsilon of row one comma row two, and given pi one and pi two on this side, you can define epsilon of pi one comma pi two. And if row one matches with pi one and row two matches with pi two, then epsilon of row one, row two should be epsilon of pi one, pi two. That's some sort of technical sounding statement, uh, but it turns out to be absolutely uh, crucial because what we want to do is we want, to, we want this big list of nice properties to have the, to, to have the kind of, to, pro, to have the property that there's exactly one correspondence. That's the point. Once we've got a nice big list of properties and we can prove there's exactly one correspondence that satisfies all the properties, then we know we've got the canonical thing. Uh, so my understanding of the history of the local lands conjectures for GLN, the big list of nice properties, uh, the big list of nice properties of the bijection, uh, that the bijection must satisfy Uh, became long enough, became, became sufficiently long, uh, sufficiently long, uh, that we could prove there was at most one local Langlands correspondence. Uh, but it became a theorem uh, that there was at most one bijection. satisfying this big list of uh, properties that we wanted. There was the most one bijection satisfying uh, uh, satisfying all the properties on the list. <coughs> Let me make two slightly philosophical points. Uh, one of them is there, there is a slight subtlety here. For, this is a statement. There's a statement that these things are canonically bijection with each other. That's a statement for each for each n, right? So this is, we're saying something. There's a bijection of two sets for n equals one. Two set, two completely different sets where n equals two. They're also in bijection, and then two more completely different sets when n is three. Blah blah blah. And uh, the list started eventually incorporating assertions where you needed more than one bijection. They were like, if pi is a two-dimensional representation, and then I've got another pi primed, which is a three-dimensional representation, then I can look at the epsilon factor of pi and pi primed. And you see that somehow, and, that, and then pi bijects with rho by the two-dimensional representation, and pi prime bijects with rho prime by the three-dimensional representation. You, you see, you, you need to take all the canonical bijections at once, and you start, uh, you start writing down lists of properties that the co collection of all bijections has. Uh, if you like, I'm taking the disjoint union over all n for both sides, and I'm bijecting those up. Uh, so these, after a while, these, uh, these lists of properties got slightly, slightly subtle, uh, and they started kind of like incorporating things where you needed all the bijections at once. But eventually, the list got, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was that, um, again, I, d I don't know if this is somehow a historical glitch, but... Um, one of the properties that we have turns out to be there's a, there's a global input. Uh, given, given pi 1 and pi 2, I want to define the epsilon factor of pi 1 comma pi 2. And the only known definition of this is global, uh, which I always strikes me as a bit odd. But anyway, uh, we, have a bunch of, we have a bunch of properties that these bijections should satisfy. Uh, it's now known there's a most one bijection satisfying these properties. And then, of course, the theorem was that there's at least one bijection. Uh, turns out there's at least one bijection. That there's at least one bijection satisfying these properties. So this is already that was already hard work proving there was a most one bijection, uh, but also there's at least one bijection. Uh,
So these are, this is, you know, this is a hard theorem, but this is a very hard theorem. Uh, so in the function field case, which I haven't really talked about, all this, all this story, if K is field of fractions of a power series ring over a finite field, then there's a highly analogous story. Uh, uh, and, there's, and there's a conjecture. So in the function field case, Uh, the existence of this bijection was uh, established by Lomond, Rappaport, and Stuhler. Uh, this is the theorem of Lomond, Rappaport, and Stuhler. Uh, and in the uh, maybe that was in the 80s. Uh, and in the in the periodic field case. This was somehow before I was mathematically born. But in the Piatic Fields case, I certainly remember it. It's a 2000, uh, 2000 theorem of Harris and Taylor. Uh, and all the proofs are global. By which I mean these are, these are statements about Piatic Fields, but the proofs involve number fields, even though the questions look purely. You know, the, the Galois group of a, of a number field is much more complicated than the Galois group of a local field. Uh, so, talking of Galois groups of local fields, um, we had a little discussion uh, about what to do between four and five. Uh, and my understanding of the conclusion of the discussion uh, was that today, between four and five, I'm going to be in here, I'll possibly even come early, and I'm just going to give an overview of what we've said so far. Uh, so no new mathematics, and I'm going to take basic questions from people who feel that they've kind of sort of half understood what's going on, but they could sure do with a little refresher and some, uh, somebody going over basic things like what a profinite group is and, uh, you know, yeah, what, I mean, there's, yeah, we're going we're gonna to recap. So people that are completely on top of everything and uh, want to ask me difficult questions about automorphic representations, don't bother coming. There's, there'll be nothing for you. Uh, but people who just kind of feel that they sort of half on, you know, maybe there's some definition that they're missing and they still find one of these sides a little bit scary. If you come along at, like, whatever, 4 o'clock, we'll just go through basic stuff. And I'll just give definitions again and prove basic properties of things. So we're going to have, yeah, we're going to be corroborating the, I don't know what we're going to be doing. We're just going to, we're going to go over the material again, kind of slowly, and there'll be questions. Uh, so if you understand stuff and you know exactly what you want to do, you want to go away and do problems and stuff then. That's fine. But we won't do problems here. We'll just do basic material again. That's between four and five. Uh, so there's the local language correspondence. And... Uh, so two really obvious things that one can say about the local language correspondence, two obvious observations. So firstly, uh, let's just check that for n equals one, uh, this, is a, this is a brilliant, this is a brilliant, uh, this is a brilliant generalization. of local class field theory. Uh, because it answers the question of what to do next after local class field theory. Right? There's somehow, there's a philosophical way of thinking about Galois groups where you realize that somehow in some sense the Galois group isn't quite the fundamental object and the representations of a Galois group are the fundamental objects, right? That's how, that's how these things work. Galois groups are like fundamental groups. You have some topological space. It doesn't really even have a well-defined fundamental group, right? It has a fundamental groupoid. There's a topological space. You choose some random point that's completely non-canonical in that topological space. And now, and now we can kind of consider loops, and there's loops that go around holes, and there's complicated loops, and we get a fundamental group, and people talk about the fundamental group of that topological space, but it's not well defined, because we had to choose a point. If you choose different points, you get different isomorphic fundamental groups, but they're not canonically isomorphic. 
you see, because if I choose a different point here, then to get an isomorphism between the groups, I need to figure out a way of taking a loop that starts here to a loop that starts here. And the way I do that is I choose a path from one to the other, but there's loads of different paths. If I choose a path that way or the path that way, I get different isomorphisms. So a fundamental group is a kind of complicated thing. It's not quite well, it's well defined up to non-unique isomorphism. It's sort of a funny thing. Uh, but there is a theorem that says the representations of that fundamental group are canonically in bijection uh, with sheaves on this, uh, on this manifold because you have all these local, these local systems. You have a local system on this manifold. And uh, so you're moving around locally. This system is staying the same. But uh, when you globally get back to where you start, you might well have uh, introduced some kind, of you know, some kind of endomorphism of your fiber space. And so you end up with a representation of this group. So it's been long known that... Uh, the, the fundamental group of an object has some sort of subtle, not quite well-defined issues. Uh, but the representations of the fundamental group are very natural, are very natural objects. And this is what's going on here. Uh, given a periodic field K, we have to choose an algebraic closure K bar. That's a bit like choosing the point. Uh, but once you've chosen it, we have, some, we, have some, we have some abstract group, and then it's the representations of the group that turn out to be the important thing. So this is a brilliant generalization of local class field theory. Uh, once we've checked, we should check this. Let's check this in a minute. Let's set n equals 1 and let's see what this says. I mean, it's a, relatively easy, uh, it's a relatively easy calculation, but I feel I should do it. Uh, and then the other, the other observation is a, is a completely, completely pointless bijection. Uh, Completely pointless, because as it relates, as it relates to two utterly uninteresting sets, right? As it relates to completely uninteresting sets. Uh, so this is a useless correspondence, because I had to write. The only reason that we know that there are smooth, irreducible, invisible representations of GLN of K was because I wrote down a definition. Uh, like we haven't come into, you know, we haven't come across these things before. They don't naturally show up when I'm doing some calculation, or that at least they haven't naturally shown up yet. Uh, so these these sets are completely pointless uh, because, you know, because somehow we have, we have not seen we have seen. Neither, neither Vedalin representations, nor, uh, nor smooth, nor smooth, admissible, irreducible representations of GLN, of GLN of K, kind of showing up anywhere else in mathematics. So you see, it's, when you look at it, at least from where you're sitting, it's a bit of a shame because there's some other lovely correspondence uh, called the taniyama shimura conjecture, which says if you have an elliptic curve over the rational numbers, then it comes from a modular form. It's like a profound theorem of a, a Bray, Conrad, Diamond, and Taylor. So you get, this, you get this dictionary, given an elliptic curve over the rationals, you can construct a modular form. And some people might say, who cares? But that is a big deal, because you've got an elliptic curve over the rationals. There's questions about it, like the birch Swinners and Dark conjecture. And the birch Swinners and Dark conjecture say, ah, oh, the value of the L function of that elliptic curve at s equals 1 should be related to some arithmetic of the curve at the rational points. But uh, if you don't know that elliptic curve's modular, you can't even analytically extend the L function to s equals 1. The power series converges to a real part of s bigger than 1 and a half. And how are you going to analytically continue it? Uh, so once you had the bijection, it gave you an incredible new tool, right? You've got an elliptic curve over the rationals. There is this a modular form. The L function of the modular form is really well behaved. It's got analytic continuation, functional equation. So now all of a sudden, the, analytic, the, the elliptic curve's L function has got these good properties. And you can at least try and formulate the birch and Dyer conjecture uh, as a rigorous mathematical assertion. See, here, here, here we're not in such a good shape because we're bijecting two rather pathological collections of objects. Uh, 
that we haven't really seen before. You know, we haven't really seen them before. So my job today, uh, I'm going to show you the next. After I've just checked that this proves class field theory, I'm going to show you some examples of Vedelin representations appearing naturally in mathematics. Uh, but for this right-hand side, I don't know really a nice simple example where these things show up locally. Uh, but I do know of relatively simple global constructions of these things. So the right-hand side will have to wait, I'm afraid. Uh, so in the future, probably next week, uh, we're going to see we're going to see the right-hand side showing up. So. So what's the plan today? Uh, so the plan for today uh, is to try and convince you that the local Langlands conjectures are actually going to be useful, right? We'll check. We'll check that this local Langlands correspondence. Well, we'll begin to check. We'll begin to check that the local Langlands correspondence is useful, right? Is actually useful. Okay, and then what we're going to do is firstly we're going to do the relatively easy n equals one thing. Uh, secondly, I'm going to show you where Ve I'm going to show you a source of Vedelin representations showing up in nature. Mathematicians have a rather strange view of nature, I guess. Uh, and then thirdly, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you the smooth, admissible, irreducible representations of GLN of K showing up naturally in nature, but I'm not in a position to do that because the only natural constructions I know are global. So we won't quite get around to that this week, uh, but I'll just do examples, examples of, of pies uh, by explicit construction. So I won't, I won't convince you that the local lands conjectures are useful today. Uh, but I'll build some pies and I'll show you I'll show you that one can actually work with them. And then once we've kind of got once once these pies have become non scary, uh, we can then uh, I can then show you how, how they might show up in the cohomology of Shimura varieties, for example. But that's uh, that's for later. So let's do n equals one. Let's just let's just do the uh, Let's do this n equals 1. Uh, how's this going to work? Actually, before, maybe I'll make some final remark before I embark on today's plan. Make some, because uh, I, 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 the remark needs to be made now because it somehow fits in with what I've just been saying. If I take any connected reductive group, If G is any connected reductive group over K, so whatever does that mean? Uh, well, it means something. Uh, it's, a, it's a geometric, it's something you can check over K bar, uh, i.e. So that means i.e. over K bar, G, G is isomorphic to uh, a group like GLN, uh, GLN or SLN or whatever, PGLN, or some orthogonal groups, or some symplectic group. You know, e, e, what are they called? E6, E7, E8. There are all these. There are these kind of crazy. There's a E6, E7, E8, F4, and G2. These are the the things that people talk about. Uh, there's some general, th this is a, I'm not going to talk about this general theory, but there's a general theory of algebraic groups. And uh, if you have a connected algebraic group over an algebraic, you know, algebraic group is just some closed subgroup of a matrix group somehow, uh, or closed subgroup of GLN. So you have some, and so these are defined by polynomial equations. This is some symplectic group, SP2G, if you like. Uh, so whatever, whatever a connected reductive group is, there are examples, and we are sticking with GLN in this course. Uh, 
but there's a huge collection of connected reductive groups that aren't GLN. And for each of these groups here, uh, Langlands wanted to uh, Langlands wanted to formulate a local correspondence. Let me just kind of tell you, uh, if you use any connected reductive group over K, then there's a then there's a Langlands correspondence, a local Langlands correspondence for G. And you can kind of imagine, uh, you could imagine what it might say. So we need some kind of Vedalin representations. So this is certain, certain Vedalin representations, rho comma n, uh, from some Gawa group, well, from some Vey group. Uh, well, where's this going to go? Uh, we had. Um, this, what, this used to say GLN of the complexes, but it turns out one has to do the, this is the L group. So this is the L group. Uh, this is some kind of duality. I mean, I don't really want to get bogged down with the details, but the L group of GLN is GLN of the complexes. Uh, but it's not quite as simple as that. The L group of SLN is PGLN of the complexes, and the L group of PGLN is SLN of the complexes. So there's some sort of slight there's some slight twist here. Uh, and these are supposed to, well, there's smooth, smooth irreducible, admissible representations of, we don't have the duality on this side. There. Uh, and it's not a bijection. Uh, it's supposed to be a surjection with finite fibers. Uh, and here, the theory is in some sense in its infancy, um, because that surjection with finite fibers uh, is supposed to be uh, canonical, and of course by canonical we mean satisfies a big list of properties. Uh, but that big list of properties is not yet known to um, uniquely so it's not yet known to kind of uniquely characterize a surjection. There's a local Landis correspondence for G, so it's satisfying a big list of natural properties. I saw this list in, um, in the Burrell's article in Corvallis. Uh, But this big list is incomplete, because when me and Toby G were trying to understand this assertion, uh, we found a very natural property that it looked like it should have that wasn't on Burrell's list, and I got quite panicky. And I emailed some experts, and they were like, oh, yeah, 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 that should definitely be on the list. So, so the list in Borel Corvart, it's, it was about, infin it was about uh, infinitesimal characters. Uh, I, won't, I won't bore you with the details. So there's a big list of natural properties, but currently, as far as I know, this big list isn't even known to uniquely characterize the map, uh, which, as far as I know, do not yet uniquely characterize this, uh, this so-called canonical surjection. So that's my understanding of what the local Landers correspondences look like for a general connected reductive group. So they're still open. Uh, and furthermore, the actual, uh, the actual statement that we want to prove is not quite pinned down, right? You have to be careful. If you just say there's a surjection, then there's a risk that at some point somebody will come up with some uh, argument that says if you fix certain invariants on both sides, then there's only finitely many things uh, here and finally many things here that you can kind of match up and the number here is at least here so just choose an arbitrary surjection. There's some uh, risk that somebody will come up with some stupid counting proof uh, that some surjection exists satisfying lots of properties but it might not be canonical. Uh, so there you go. Uh, 
there. I don't know the answer to that. For GLN, the bound is one, obviously. For SLN, I think that for SL2, the bound is four, or uh, most four. I think maybe the bound is even two for SL2. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So the, the, I should say, now you've mentioned it, these, fi these finite fibers are called L packets. Uh, fibers are called L packets. So there's no L packets for GLN, but uh, if you want to move away from GLN and do more general groups, then I would recommend you go in one of either two directions. Uh, the first direction is you can go to SL2, which is a great example because it turns out it already shows you a lot of the phenomena. If, if G is the group SL2, then you're looking at representations of SL2 of the piadic numbers, say. And they're supposed to be related to Vedalin representations to PGL2 of the complexes. And you see, the, the reason it's a natural place to go is if you know the bijection for GL2, then you can attempt to deduce the surjection for SL2. And uh, somehow Langlands and Lebes talk about this kind of thing. In a paper of the... Langlands and Lebes is one of these papers that I almost feel I could read if I tried really hard, but I had never quite done it. Uh, and the other, the other direction you can go is for a G... Um, a class fill theory, we know that worked really well, uh, so you could go with a non-split torus, right? So for GL1, we know it, but what about some weird inner form of GL1 that isn't that somehow... GL1, but with Galois acting in a slightly non-trivial way. So, for example, the, uh, you could take a quadratic extension of K, and you could look at the things in that quadratic extension whose norm was 1. That's some kind of twisted form of GL1. And you could see if you could prove it for that, because you kind of feel that for abelian groups, you could kind of use class fill theory to your advantage. Uh, so that was done, that was done by Langlands in the only paper of Langlands I've ever, re I've ever read. Uh, so there's the local Langlands conjectures for general G. That's as far as I know the state of the art. Uh, and I must be frank, I don't really understand the details of how this proof goes for GLN. Uh, but I'm not scared of the local Langlands correspondence. And the reason I'm not scared of it is because I went to this 1992 course by Richard Taylor where he wrote down lots of examples for GL2. And I kind of did some exercises with them. And I realized that actually these things weren't that scary. So that's really my main aim today, is to start writing down examples of smooth, admissible, irreducible representations of GL2 of the periodic numbers, just to convince you that, uh, just to convince you that this side is not so scary. And I've written down examples of this side, so hopefully you're less scared by this. I mean, unless you're scared by Gawa groups, in which case you should come along today at uh, 4 o'clock and we'll talk about Gawa groups. Uh, right, so let me just knock off this case n equals 1. Let's do, what are the, so local Langlands, local Langlands correspondence for n equals 1. Uh, this is supposed to say I've got some Vedalin representation. Oh, I guess these are, yeah. These have to be F semi-simple in some, I mean, I don't want to get through. They're compl I mean, it's quite complicated. If you really want to see the state, I mean, I would thoroughly recommend this Borel. Borel in Corvallis. I would thoroughly recommend it because there, there are real thorny issues. Uh, there are thorny issues in saying exactly what we need. For GLM, these things are just not there. That's why I'm keen to stick to GLM. Uh, Local lines could just n equals 1. Uh, let's, let's try and firstly understand the left-hand side. The left-hand side, we're looking at one-dimensional Vedalin representations. Right? Got rho 0, comma n from, uh, Gal no, sorry, from the V group, from WK uh, to, where are we going? Uh, to GL1 of C. And remember, C doesn't have the usual topology. C has the discrete topology. Uh, so, the, so the identity is open. The kernel of this map will be open. Uh, uh, but I don't even need that. I just need that the kernel is closed. Ah, so I, N is a one by one nilpotent matrix, right? So here N is going to be one by one nilpotent matrix. Right, so that implies that N is zero. Because all the eigenvalues must be zero, but a one by one matrix is determined by its eigenvalues. Uh, so row zero, of course, row zero 
this goes from the Weil group of K to GL1 of C, and the kernel is closed, the kernel of row zero is closed, and I gave you this definition, remember, given a random topological group, I can look at the abstract commutator subgroup, uh, uh, which will be a normal subgroup, and if I quotient out a random topological group by its commutator subgroup, I'll get a group that might be pathological, because uh, it might not be Hausdorff. But if I take the closure of the commutator, uh, then the quotient is Hausdorff and abelian. Uh, but you see that's certainly what's happening here. The image of row zero is Hausdorff and abelian. So the kernel of row zero is closed, and therefore row zero factors through uh, uh, WK ab, right? So WK ab, remember, means not just the abelianization as an abstract group, but uh, somehow the uh, a Hausdorff abelianization. So there we go. So we've discovered what the left-hand side looks like. Uh, it's just one-dimensional representations. Uh, of WK ab. So therefore, the left hand side uh, equals the one dimensional uh, continuous complex representations of, of WK ab. And now it's the right hand side. Uh, this smooth, irreducible, admissible representations of K star. Uh, so I want pi to be a smooth, admissible, irreducible representation of K star. So this is this huge, infinite abelian group K star acting on uh, a possibly infinite dimensional complex vector space. But, these, but it has some nice continuity properties, very strong continuity properties from smoothness and admissibility. So it's not so difficult to check that admissible plus irreducible uh, implies that uh, the dimension of pi is finite. Uh, uh, and, and then from there, you can prove that the dimension of pi is 1. So there's, there's some relatively straightforward exercises. This doesn't work for GL2. This is, you, need, you need the fact that there's nice, compact, open, normal subgroups. That's the point. Uh, because there's you, you living in GL1 of K, compact, open, implies that U is normal. That, that fails for GL2, but uh, fails for GL2 quite seriously. That's some other key point. Uh, so the right-hand side, even though I was always constantly selling these, these are obviously hugely infinite dimensional in general, blah, blah, blah. In the case of GL1, there's a funny coincidence, and they're all one-dimensional. So therefore, the right-hand side uh, just turns out to be continuous, uh, continuous group homomorphisms. So continuity turns out to be equivalent to smooth admissibility. Uh, so continuous turns out to be smooth admissible. Well, I think continuous is just the same as smooth, actually. Continuous group homomorphisms from K star to C star. Right? Uh, and so the left-hand side was continuous group homomorphisms from WK ab to C star. So now you can see why local class field theory gives you a canonical bijection. Uh, so it's W gay ab equals K star. So there we go. So local Lyons conjectures for GL1. Uh, so that indeed implies local Langlands conjectures for GL1. So as you'll recall, my next complaint uh, is that whenever do we see either of these sides showing up in mathematics? Uh, so that's my. Next task now, I'm going to show you some Vaderlin representation. I'm going to show those of you, uh, I mean, I guess 
what I'm now going to do is, given some other objects, I'm going to construct some Vagelin representations. And if you've seen those other objects, then I will have justified Vagelin representations. But if you've never seen the other objects either, then I'll have just made matters worse, I guess. So, uh, so let me tell you about the other objects. Uh, and they might be playing a bit of a role when we do some global stuff later. But let me just briefly say something about L-adic representations. Uh, so, source source of Vaudelin representations uh, something called L-adic representations. So, this. For those of you who are kind of wondering where this course is going, I'm going to do a little bit more with Galois groups now, uh, and then the Galois groups are going to be all gone, right? I'm going to, do, I'm going to talk about some other thing called an l representation. I'm going to show you that they give Vaudelin representations. I'm going to remark that they show up in nature if you look for them, and then there'll be no more Galois theory for quite some time. We'll be doing a very algebraic thing. We're going to be talking about these pies. Uh, so we're going to be doing possibly infinite dimensional representations, but of very concrete groups like GL2 of QP. Uh, so if you're slightly scared of these abstract Galois groups, this is the last you'll be seeing of them for a while. Source of Vaudelin representations, l representations. So here the story is, uh, so let's have K over QP finite as ever. There. But now let's say, uh, let's say, uh, Let's say our coefficient field is QL. So let's say rho goes from gal k bar over k to GLN of QL is a continuous is a continuous representation. Uh, so what's going on here? Gal k bar over k is my profinite group with its usual profinite topology. GLN of QL. So here. Here, L is prime, L isn't P. Uh, I mean, L can be P for the next five minutes or so, but L is certainly going to have to not be P at some point. L is prime, L is not P. Uh, and QL, QL has the L-addict topology. There. Uh, so that means that n by n matrices over QL are a topological ring, so GLN is a topological group. So, so GLN, GLN of QL also has some kind of l adic topology. And of course, rho is continuous. Uh, so we haven't seen things like this before. Uh, because the only representations I've considered before were to targets uh, where the group was discrete. And so in particular, the complicated inertia subgroup of this would have to be finite. So here things are worse because the inertia has got a wild part and a tame part, and the wild part is a pro-p group. And so that's a very, it has a rather p adic topology. This has a rather l adic topology, and p is not equal to l. So the wild part of inertia will end up being finite. But the tame part of inertia has got a huge l adic part. Uh, so in theory, the tame part of inertia might live on. Uh, so what I'm saying is, when we considered representations of the Vey group to GLN of the complexes, or GLN of some random field E with the discrete topology, we knew instantly that the image of inertia had to be finite by some compactness argument. Whereas here, the image of inertia might, in theory, not be finite. Uh, so. So two things to observe uh, is that firstly, uh, these show up in nature, right? Note one, these show up in nature. So where do they come from? Uh, E.g., Tate module of an elliptic curve, right? Of an elliptic curve, E 
over k. Uh, so if you know what Tate modules are, there's one. Uh, well, more generally, uh, turns out that this, that this case, uh, this is actually a special case of the thing I'm about to say. Uh, what about El Adica Tal cohomology? Of an algebraic variety. Uh, you know, H I et al of x over k bar with coefficients in QL. So x over k in algebraic variety. So when I was your age, I had no idea what that meant at all. Uh, but the thing you need to know about it uh, is that the vast majority of El Adic Gower representations that show up in nature have come from etal cohomology. So there's the second huge source. Uh, and then finally, uh, Eladic deformations. Uh, Eladic deformations of these things. Uh, whatever. Of, of examples. I give new examples. So for example, uh, you might take a representation that you have already coming from El Adic cohomology or something. You could maybe reduce the entire thing mod L, and then you could start looking at deformations back into characteristic zero. And these are somehow quite well understood. You can look at deformation rings, and you, can look at, and you end up with representations to GLN of R, where R is some huge, some huge, for example, an affinoid QL algebra or something. They will have lots and lots of surjections down to QL and might give you an entire family of such representations. So there they show up, and these are kind of things close to my heart, really, because uh, when you look at these l deformations, these give you geometric objects that somehow go into the whole eigencurve story. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. That story doesn't really matter now. The point is uh, that these things do show up in nature, and somehow the more, you know, the more nature you get interested in, the more, the more of them you'll see. Uh, and the key thing I just wanted to say, just to convince you that we weren't complete, completely wasting our time with this local Langlands thing, uh, is that given such a row, it turns out we can construct a Vedelin representation. Uh, in fact, while I'm here, let me just give one example. Uh, if you know... If you know Tate modules of elliptic curves, all well and good. But uh, if I give you some random elliptic curve and ask you to compute the Tate module, that can kind of be tricky. But there is actually one example where Tate modules are really easy to compute. Uh, so let me just, for those of you that know about elliptic curves and Tate modules, uh, so maybe I'll make some remark. Uh, if E is an elliptic curve, This is not logically relevant for the course, but it seems like it might be worth noting as an example. If here's an elliptic curve with split multiplicative reduction, so it's with bad reduction, uh, if you have an elliptic curve with the complexes, then it turns out you can uniformize it, right? Elliptic curve over the complexes is the complex numbers modulo a lattice. Uh, so it turns out an elliptic curve over a p-adic field, if it has split multiplicative reduction, you can, you can also uniformize it. Uh, then it turns out that E of k bar is almost canonically isomorphic to kind of k bar star modulo q to the z. Uh, so maybe I'll put q to the z there with q, q in k, norm q less than 1. So this is the multiplicative group, uh, and this is some crazy subgroup isomorphic to Z. So this is a, some strange, this is not Q the finite field, this is just some random Q. Uh, and from this you can work out the Tate module. Of, Tate, of the Tate module. Uh, 
and somehow what you learn uh, and what you and what you'll see is that uh, so this L addict tape module of E, if I restrict it to an inertia group, uh, looks like kind of the cyclotomic character something zero the identity, where this is really really can be non-trivial. And infinite. I guess it's a silly thing to say it's cyclotomic. I think, but probably uh, uh, because it, the cyclotomic character is trivial on inertia. But uh, the, this remark is simply to say, oh look, the image of inertia was always finite in the entire course. And I'm just saying, actually, I know one example where you take the L-adic tape module, you get infinite inertia here. Uh, so it can happen. So if you, I mean. Uh, so these aladic representations, I'm arguing that they show up in nature, but I'm also arguing that they're slightly scarier than the representations we were studying, uh, because we can't, con we can't quite control the image of inertia anymore. Uh, but what I want to tell you uh, is, again, cribbing straight from... T this is the last... I've been, I don't know if you realise, but I've been sticking quite closely to Tate's paper in Corvallis. Uh, for these last couple of lectures. And uh, let me... I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Now I go. So the problem with just standing here waffling is that I end up doing everything in the wrong order. Here we go. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Right. But um, uh, now let me tell you... Let me tell you a result of Grothendieck, a relatively simple result of Grothendieck. Uh, that's going to spit out Vaderlin representations. So, um, so recall L is not equal to P. And so this does actually show uh, uh, we. So if rho is some ad, is an L adic representation as above, as above, uh, then rho of inertia can be infinite. Elliptic curve example was supposed to be uh, uh, for those of you that know for those of you that know the machinery. You can kind of go and convince yourself that uh, that row of inertia can be infinite, but it can't be too bad. Uh, but it can't be too bad. Oops. It can't be too bad uh, because rho of the Sulov subgroup. I mean, rho of i k bar over k. Comma epsilon must be finite if epsilon's bigger than zero, because this is the this is pro p. Remember, right? The moment we start looking at the uh, the filtration on this thing, uh, this is pro p, and the tame inertia is not so bad, right? So the issue is tame inertia, uh, and recall, gal k tamely ramified over k unramified. So I'm not particularly scared of the unramified thing because that's cyclic, but this is kind of cyclic as well, right? This is non-canonically isomorphic to the product. Now I have a problem, and I don't quite know how to solve it. And the problem is that I need a letter for a prime number because I've got P and L, and I've used their P and L are already playing roles, and Q is a good letter for a prime number, but Q I've, like, I've already used, I'm already overusing Q. There's a Q. And Q was the size of the residue field. So I haven't got a good letter for prime. So I'm going to use R, right? So R is going to be prime. R not equal to P. These are the r adic integers. So for most values of R, R is not equal to L. Uh, and those are going to die as well under rho. Uh, so the, clearly the interesting part, uh, clearly the part we should be worried about, The part we should be worrying about is the ZL part. Uh, because that's the part that's threatening not to die, you see. Where uh, all these ZRs are going to be 
they're not going to they're not going to last long in GLN of QL. But this ZL part can absolutely there's a subgroup of GL2 QL isomorphic to ZL, right? It's just one ZL01, and that's what's going on here, in fact. Uh, so these representations, I mean, who cares about VE groups? We really care about Gower groups. Hello. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Can you repeat what you said at the very end of the board up there? Row of something. Row of this. So this inertia group has got some filtration on it. And uh, so this inertia group is mostly pro P. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. This is the higher number, the upper numbering on these higher ramific on these ramification groups. Uh, somehow there's the zero part, which is everything, and then the moment you leave that, you're pro p, uh, and so you can't, and so you're not going to survive. And all of these, all of these zrs aren't going to survive either. I mean, maybe they'll leave some finite residue, but uh, they're not going to survive. But this zl part might really, might really inject in. So we need to kind of isolate that zl part. Uh, and what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an artificial choice. Uh, I'm going to just define some map that's traditionally called T, uh, and I will stick to tradition. So let me fix T from gal KT over K and R. Uh, let me, let me write down some random surjection to ZL. Right, so this is TL, right? Uh, so there we go. And let's also fix, let's also, let's also fix phi in gal k bar over k, uh, lifting Frobenius in gal k n r over k. So while I'm fixing phi and t, uh, what I'm supposed to be, what I'm attempting to argue here, uh, is that I've got this, we've got this L adic representation rho of this Gawar group, and somehow that Gawar group, I'm thinking about it in three stages. We have the unramified bit, and that's going to be controlled by what's happening to phi. And then we have the tamely ramified bit here, uh, and that's going, to, that's going to correspond to, that's going to be controlled by t, and then we have the wildly ramified part, which is pro p, so it's going to be finite. So I've got all the ingredients here to attempt to classify rho in some strange, you know, I, I should have enough ingredients to be able to say something about, about rho. That's, that's what's going on. Uh, phi and t and a finite amount of inertia should somehow, should somehow tell us about rho. And so let me now just... Uh, so here's a proposition, which is apparently due to Grothendieck. Uh, and the proof is long, uh, but not so difficult, right? So if, if I have rho goes from uh, gal k bar over k to GLN of E, where now E is QL, you know, E can be a finite extension of QL, if you like. So if I've got a continuous l adic representation, then I claim, or then Grothendieck claims, then there exists a unique, up to isomorphism, Vedelin representation, rho 0, comma n, from WK to GLN of E. So now, of course, this is a this is a Vedelin representation. So now E has the discrete topology, right? Because that's how Vedelin representations work. Uh, and rho zero comma n is somehow coming from rho. Uh, you see, but the the point I want to make is that the WK. Uh, is a subgroup of gal k bar over k. So given rho, there's a really obvious way of getting a rho zero I could just restrict. But unfortunately, that restriction might not be continuous because I'm goofing around with the topology on the right-hand side. Right? So here's my first guess. Rho zero is just the restriction of rho 
to the Vey group. Uh, but the ridiculous, the ridiculous observation is because I drop the topology on E, suddenly there's so many more open sets here, which makes it much harder for this map to be continuous. And if we just dropped, if we define row zero to be row, then things like this would actually give us examples of discontinuous representations. So rho is not going to be rho zero. Uh, well, rho zero is not going to be the restriction of rho. But I've carefully uh, copied out from Tate's article <laughs> what it is. So, uh, so it turns out this. Uh, so such that uh, rho of phi to the m times sigma, so phi is this lift of Frobenius, and sigma is in the inertia group. So every element of the Gawa, no, that's not true, every element of the Vey group, at least, is going to be of that form, because m is an integer. Right, I'm about to give you a formula for rho of phi to the m. I'm, basically, I'm about to give you a formula for rho on the Vey group, and that will be enough uh, uh, somehow knowing, knowing rho on the Vey group is, is the same as knowing rho because the Vey group is dense in the Gamma group. So rho of phi to the m sigma turns out to be rho zero of phi to the m sigma multiplied by x of n times t of sigma. Uh, so, n is a, so n is a nilpotent matrix so n times t, t sigma is a number, and so n times t sigma is a nilpotent matrix. An exp of a nilpotent matrix is just 1 plus m plus m squared over 2 factorial plus, plus m to the n over m factorial, right? You don't need to go any more uh, because after a while the powers of m will be 0. So that there's no issue about infinite sums. It will just always converge because it's a finite sum. Uh, so what's happening here? What's happening here is that um, you can see the difference. Rho is not rho zero because you can see the difference here. The difference is some strange. Uh, the difference is some strange x of n. So what's happening? Uh, yeah. So maybe there's, that's the end of the statement of the proposition. So maybe I'll make some remark. Uh, in this take in the take curve example uh, it turns out that somehow that n is non zero that upper upper right hand triangular issue that I was concerned about is somehow fixed this is exactly the role it's exactly the role that uh, this funny t plays uh, the the uh, non the non-triviality of rho on inertia is kind of eaten up by n, and everything else is behaving sensibly, so we can use rho zero. Uh, so normally, theorems of Grothendieck are incredibly difficult to prove, but this is just a good insight. This is a. This is just. This is a. This is trivial for Grothendieck. He's just observing that he understands monodromy quite well. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, this is of an independent interest, really, because given some random l adic Gawa representation that's fallen out the sky, we're constructing some monodromy operator. That somehow sounds like a geometric... You know, you're trying to understand fancy cohomology theories using geometry. I mean, I, given that I'm here, I might as well make some final remarks. Um, just make some, a couple of remarks about this proposition. Final few remarks. Uh, not all Vedalin representations are going to show up in this way because there's a sort of stupid observation. Row of, row of a Frobenius element. Uh, see, the Frobenius element generates a z hat in gal k bar over k, and that actually puts some constraints on the eigenvalues of row of a Frobenius. So uh, you, if, if row 0, comma n arises in this way, Uh, then eigenvalues of row zero, 
of, of rho zero of a Frobenius will be will be L adic units. So in particular, it's not difficult to write down an L adic representation that doesn't arise in this manner because you can just make rho L of rho zero of Frobenius. You can just send it to the number L or something. Uh, so in particular, so 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 not all rho zero comma n arise in this way. On the other hand, that's somehow the only obstruction. Uh, on the other hand, you know, conversely, uh, if the eigenvalues, if rho zero comma n is given, uh, and the eigenvalues are, and the eigenvalues of rho zero are L adic units. Rho zero does come from rho. Oh, right. So there you go. So that's rather that's just rather been a long interlude, really. But what I'm saying is, this local Langlands correspondence matching up two group two sets that nobody in this room has ever been concerned with, as it were. Uh, what I'm arguing is that actually you should you should open your mind to the possibility that in the future uh, you will see things showing up on one or other side of this bijection. Uh, for example, if you study L adic representations. Uh, so that's that. That I've done. Let me just check. If you make things up too much, then things get really. Da 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 da. Done that, done that, done that. Da 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 da. Now go back eight pages. Just done that. Da 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 da. Right, now go back five pages. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Great. Uh, let's let's talk about pies. I gave you the definition of them last time. Uh, but let's do examples. Uh, oh, no, it's independent of everything. Sorry, I should maybe say that. Uh, it's, uh, I should say, where have I said blah, 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 blah. Uh, yeah, that's worth remarking, isn't it? This should go here somehow. Isomorphism class, I don't know where to put it. Isomorphism class of rho, thank you, that's a, that's a nice question. Isomorphism class of rho zero comma n is independent of choice of, of both phi and of t. So there you go. It's a, it is a canonical thing. You know, I chose a basis, but it was independent of the choice of basis. There you go. So the exercise, why don't you figure out a way of formulating it without ever choosing anything? That might be hard, I don't know. <laughs> uh, smooth and miscible representations of GLN of K. Well, there is one thing I want to say about N equals 1. Last thing I want to say... about n equals 1, is let me just show you, I said that these local Langlands bijections should satisfy a nice list of properties, and they should, you know, I, I, go, I never tell you what they are, but I always say, oh, you know, pi has an L function, and rho has an L function, and the L function should be the same, if rho and pi match up. Uh, but pi and rho both have conductors, and so it occurred to me that, I did tell you what the conductor of, uh, I told you what the conductor of rho zero was, uh, so maybe I should tell you what the conductor of pi is in this case. Conductors, conductors of representations are a little bit tricky. Last thing I want to say about n equals 1, if I've got, uh, if I've got some pi from, from k star to c star, is smooth, is smooth, admissible, irreducible. Uh, I can tell you what the conductor of pi is. And I should have told you 
I should have told you when I talked about this before, but I forgot, and I just feel that it's such an easy thing to say. I, just, I can't figure out where to say this, so I'm just going to say it now. Uh, then define f of pi uh, just to be the smallest the smallest integer r uh, well let me define f of pi let's do this properly let's define f of pi to be zero if pi on the inertia of pi on ok star is trivial uh, and and f of pi equals r at least 1 if r is the smallest positive integer uh, uh, if r is the smallest positive integer such that pi restricted to 1 plus p to the power of r ok have I got this right? I think so is trivial. So if if f of pi isn't zero, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I wrote down there because there was. A, I remembered I'm supposed, supposed to put something on, on the on the k. Yeah. So these give you as r increases, this gives you a basis of open neighbourhoods of the identity, and. Uh, this pi is continuous, and C star has the discrete topology, so the kernel of pi is open. So the kernel of pi will contain one of these. You see, this is kind of what I it's kind of slightly ridiculous, but I want to define 1 plus pk to the power 0 ok. You want that to be ok star, right? That's, I mean, I've never found a good way of making that mathematically rigorous, and what I've written is not true, right? Because the left-hand side is OK and the right-hand side is OK star. But this is for notational convenience. If you had that, then, then I could just define f of pi to be the smallest r at least 0 with this property. Uh, so the reason I mention that is because uh, now, it's a little, now it's a slightly tricky argument, you see, that I've defined f of pi. And so now, because I've defined f of rho 0, uh, I could ask that f of rho 0 equal f of pi, you see. Uh, it just seemed to me like another example. So, Langlands correspondence, local Langlands correspondence for n equals 1. Uh, if kind of rho, rho 0 equals rho 0 comma n, remember n has to be 0, matches up with pi, then, uh, then we want f of rho 0 should equal to f of pi. And that's actually a little bit tricky to check. Uh, and this is true. But to check it, you probably need to know more about f's than I've told you. <laughs> so you see, so there's an example of how the local Landers conjectures are supposed to be natural. I've got conductors on both sides, and the conductors are the same. Uh, right. n equals 2. So it's time to wind up. Uh, I think I'll finish by just writing down, I'm going to write down the thing that we're going to be studying in 15 minutes' time. So now we're going to spend a long time, probably all of the next lecture, doing examples of smooth, irreducible, admissible representations of GL2 of a periodic field. Uh, and let me stress that if you think about it now, you don't need to know anything about Galois theory or anything about anything. You just need to remember the definition of smooth and irreducible and admissible. Uh, so here's a cool construction. of a pi, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about in the next lecture. So let's say I've got, so I'm just going to write down the definition, then we're going to stop. And then let's come, we'll come back to it 15 minutes later. But if I write it down now, then you can kind of mull it over whilst you're having your coffee and uh, understand it in some, you know, some strange way that our brains work. Uh, so let's say we've got chi 1 and chi 2 uh, from k star to c star continuous. So given a pair of characters, I'm going to show you how to get a representation of GL2 of K. Uh, 
Uh, and here's, here's what we do. Let's define I of chi 1 comma chi 2 to be the following functions. So this is going to be a big complex vector space and an element, am I going to sneeze? I'm not going to sneeze. And an element, am I going to sneeze? of this complex vector space is going to be a function from GL2 of K to the complex numbers. Uh, so maybe I'll just say that uh, this is supposed to be a vector space, so we're going to have to work out how to add and multiply two such functions, and you do it, you do it on the target. Right? Phi1 plus Phi2 of X is Phi1 of X plus Phi2 of X, and lambda times Phi1 of X is lambda times phi1 of x. So we've got complex valued functions on some group, uh, satisfying a couple of conditions. Firstly, phi is locally constant. That's sort of a funny thing. You don't normally see that with functions, by which I, that by which I literally mean, given, a, given an element in GL2k, there is some small neighbourhood of that element on which phi is the constant function. So you would imagine, uh, you see when you have a nice connected topological space like the real numbers, if you had a locally constant function it would be constant. But this group is totally disconnected, it's like the opposite of being connected. The only connected subsets are one point sets. So you can have lots and lots of locally constant functions that aren't constant. It's like being one on ZP and zero on QP, mod, yeah, QP other than ZP. That's a perfectly good locally constant function on QP. Uh, so phi has to be locally constant, and phi has to transform in a certain way. Phi of A, B, 0, D times G. So A, B, 0, D is a random element of GL2 of K, which is upper triangular, and G is a random element of GL2 K. That has to be... Uh, it's going to be related to phi of g, but in a perhaps slightly strange way. It's chi 1 of a multiplied by chi 2 of d multiplied by the norm of a over d square root. Uh, I'll have something to say about this rather strange factor next time. Multiplied by phi of g. So it's not all locally constant functions on GL2 of K. It's locally constant functions that satisfy some kind of compatibility when you multiply on the left by an element in the upper triangular matrices. So you should think of this as this is somehow induction from uh, B to G of, of some one-dimensional representation, right? Where B is star, star, zero, star. So you can probably, if you know about induction, when you induce from an infinite index subgroup, you're probably going to get an infinite dimensional representation. So there's a complex vector space. So I'm just going to finish by saying how... Uh, I just need to finish by uh, giving an action of GL2QP on that space. So that's the last thing I'll write before the break. Uh, so how does... How does GL2QP act on this space I, or G, sorry, GL2 of K, uh, define? So let's just define pi. Pi of G, so G is in GL2 of K, of course. So pi of G, uh, that's supposed to be a map from this complex vector space to itself. So. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I should write that. Define pi explicitly from GL2 of K to the automorphisms of I of chi 1, chi 2 by pi of G. Uh, so pi of G is supposed to be a map from I chi 1, chi 2 to itself. So pi of G takes as input some phi. Uh, and now this is supposed to be a function so I need to evaluate that function at some random h in GL2 of k. And this is supposed to be a complex number. 
So given this data here, I need to come up with a complex number. So it's going to be 5 something. And it's either going to be 5GH or 5HG, and one of them won't give an action. Uh, so I'm going to go with 5HG, I think. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm going to go with 5GH. So there we go. Uh, yeah, there's a thing. <laughs> so we'll talk a little more about it in 50 minutes' time. Have we got it wrong? Sorry? I might have it wrong. Go on. No, no, I think it's right. But GL2K is given the topology induced from the, like, the piatic topology. Oh, yeah. K, K has the natural topology. Yeah. The other, other and locally constant really means. It's really a non trivial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The image is what? Sorry? Yeah, I need C. Yeah, this is a vector space. And so I need, I need all of C. I definitely, want, I definitely want I of chi 1, chi 2 to have a zero vector. Have I got it wrong? Yeah, I've got this wrong. I, I thought, I'm really pleased I've got this wrong. Thank you. Uh, because I looked... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what happens was I, uh, you should, somehow a common maxim is that you should stick to your notes. And what happened was I wrote pi of g and then I looked down at my notes and I saw that I'd written pi of h. So I was already in trouble. <laughs> and now I bet what I've done, my no I'm sure my notes are correct because I write them when I'm kind of thinking straight. Yeah, so I, I'm, I made a howler, sorry. What a way to finish. This is, this is now correct. In fact, let's all go and do this as an exercise. <laughs> right? This is an action. <laughs> and that exercise would have been rather harder had I got it incorrect. <laughs> so, if, so, there's a, there's a really goofy way of checking that this is an action. I'll show you, I'll show you, a, beginning of the next lecture, I'll show you a way of checking that that's an action in your head. Yeah, so here's, here's, a, here's a hard exercise. Check it's an action in your head. Right, you understand what needs to be checked. You need to check that if you do pi of g and then pi of h, it comes out as pi of gh, right? And that's clearly what you were doing already when you spotted that I got the definition wrong. Right? 